I'm here today to present another guest brought to us through Artificial Resurrection. Today I'll be speaking with Ibn Battuta from the early 14th century. He is a Moroccan Muslim who is well known for traveling Africa and Asia at an expense that even Marco Polo did not accomplish. Welcome back, Ibn. Thanks. It's been a while. I, I like your fez. Yes. Uh, this I got in India. However, generally, you would see me wearing a turban. Or sometimes a chechia. And a chechia is... A type of headwear from North Africa. My home. That is much like this, but thinner and made from a different material. All right. Anyways, let's begin. You are one of the greatest travelers of all time. Tell us about yourself. Well, thank you for the compliment. I am a traveler, although I was mostly reclusive until I was 22. That's when I began my journey. What made you want to leave home? Just wanting to get up and get out? Not really. As a follower of the Muslim religion, I need to, at one point in my life, take the Hajj, which is a journey to the birthplace of Islam in Mecca and Medina. Okay, the Hajj, is this required? We all do it. It is one of the five pillars of Islam. I see. So, why don't you talk us through your journey? Skip a, skip a, a little bit, though. Just give us the more memorable moments, because we've got limited time here. Okay. When I started, it was a very hard thing to do. My parents were still alive, and we were close, so it was a very sorrowful moment in my life. I, after I left them, I set out alone to my first destination, Tilson. Why alone, though? You know, you were sad from parting your parents. It seems like you would want to bring some friends along. At the time, I had decided to part myself from my friends as well, so I could keep my focus on the journey to these sanctuaries. And I'm sure you met people along the way as well. Yes. In Miliana, I met some ambassadors of the Sultan of Tunis, a city on the way of my journey. I stayed with them for a while, but they became very ill, and one even died from the summer heats. At that point, I left them and joined a group of merchants on the way to Tunis. We passed through Al Jazir and Constantine and Boa. Oh, in Bajaya, we had a frightful encounter with the city's commander, the Chamberlain Ibn Sayyid Anas. Who here is the man of Algiers? I am commander. Why do you request me? I wish to speak to you in private. Where are your possessions? They are just in my tent. Is there a problem? No question. This is a government command. Just leave me there. Three thousand diamonds of gold. I would wonder how one such as yourself would come to buy such a hefty possession. He was entrusted to me by a friend, a Tunisian merchant, after his death to deliver it to his heirs in Tunis. It is not only valuable gold, but also a sentimental value. A believable story, but not by my ears. I've received word of a thief, such as yourself, the exact sum. Stolen from the Tucson government. As a government agent, it is my obligation to review you of your possession. This man was robbed unjustly. This was the first I saw of the Tunisian government's tyranny. And how was the Algerian guy after that? He was well, but I was not. While still in Bajaya, I became ill. Ibn Mazera, you are not well. When you reach town tomorrow, you should stay there and get better. If God decrees my death, it shall be on the road towards Mecca. If that is your resolve, sell your ass and your heavy baggage, and I shall lend you what you require. In this way, you will travel light, for we must make haste on our journey for fear of meeting the roving Arabs on the way. I followed his advice, and soon after we reached Constantina, possibly known to as Constantine, where, after getting caught in the rain, the governor of the city offered us new clothing and his kindness. May God reward him. All right, so after a bad start to your journey, you did end up meeting some good people and some nice people. That's good. Yes, my journey was mostly good, and we did meet many people who offered us hospitality and gifts. In Alexandria, my destination after Tunis, we came across a man who miraculously bestowed gifts on all his visitors every day without question. That seems a little too nice. One of the five pillars of Islam is charity, my friend. 
There was another man in Alexandria that also offered me hospitality, a holy man of the city, Buran Aldin, with whom I stayed for a short while. It seemed a new idea at the time to me, and overwhelming to never cease my travels. But his prediction became my reality. So where did you go after this? Well, I visited the Christian religious sites, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and Hebron. Was that a necessary step on your journey to uh, Mecca? I mean, they are Christian sites, not Muslim ones. We Muslims do believe in Jesus and in his story. Even though we do have many different beliefs, we are not completely so. Okay, sorry. Uh, go on. What did you see there? Well, it's not much of a story, just sightseeing. But there is an interesting story from our next destination, Damascus. Who are we going to hear today? Taki Adin Ibn Taibiyah. He is idolized by the people, but there is something wrong in his head. There was one time in his preaching that he made a controversial statement and was punished greatly for it. In jail, he wrote a 40-volume commentary on the Quran, except he called the Quran the ocean instead. <laughs> but he's, he, he is released now and preaching today. I had reached that city one year and two months after I first departed from home, and we stayed there for a while. But I was near the end of my journey, so I thought at the time, and had soon after reached the holy city of Medina. Now, more than an entire year of traveling, what made you decide to keep going on with your journey after you reached your destination? Well, I didn't leave right away. I traveled back and forth between Mecca and Medina. They are such beautiful and clean cities that I stayed in that region for four years. But then I just had to go, to see more and travel more, you know? My next destination was Yemen, to which I traveled in a part in, on boat. This was the first time I had traveled on the sea, and I hated it. I am a man who is very easily seasick. Now, I hate to interrupt you, but we are out of time and this seems a decent stopping place. Just give the viewers a bit of perspective about how much of your journey do you think we've covered so far. I would confidently say less than half. If you want to learn more, you can read my book, Travels in Asia and Africa, 1325 to 1354, which is, you told me, early available now to everyone in the world, thanks to the internet. Ah, yes, thanks to internet. May God reward him. Um, thank you for joining us today, and be sure to check out our website, interviewingdeadpeople.com, and uh, also be sure to tune into our next episode, an interview with Genghis Khan, or as they called him back then, Chickens.